Uh, Winter's Tale has a really interesting origin story too, even as, you know, uh, it's, it's been billed as the Asian Shakespeare of the season. And uh, the idea came to us um, via a board member. And OSF has this wonderful legacy that Bill has brought into the institution of uh, these Shakespeare productions from a cultural lens, we're using a cultural perspective on it. And we had done, as some of you might know, the Measure for Measure, that had a Latino perspective, the Comedy of Errors. Um, and so uh, there was a conversation last fall about well, what we haven't really done a Shakespeare with an Asian perspective. And um, there were a number of the Asian American artists uh, at large at OSF who felt that this was a really, really important uh, initiative um, and a really important production as a means of expressing, I guess, a different kind of, of way of telling this fairy tale. Uh, and this, uh, the approach I've taken with Winter's Tale is that it is first and foremost a fairy tale. It has a source text, it was Robert Greene's Pandosto, which is weaved into parts of the text. Um, a lot of our design uh, has been devised uh, between myself and the designers and contributed to by the actors. Um, we're making our Cecilia, we're making our Bohemia. Um, for me, the play has always been about uh, a sense of unity, right? The play is actually two plays. For those of you who know the text, you have the play that's set in Cecilia and a play that's set in Bohemia. And at the end of the play, these two disparate halves come together to form a larger, cohesive whole. Uh, and the thing I've been telling the cast is everyone knows that they're part of this pie and no one knows what the entire pie looks like, right? Which is how we get into this, this, ish, this theme of reconciliation, of recognition, of awakening, forgiveness, is realizing that the universe is bigger and grander before us. And there's something very humbling about working on a play that does that to you. You know, we were talking about um, why is it that so many people love The Winter's Tale and yet it always gets outproduced by Twelfth Night or Midsummer. you know? Um, the number of folks I've talked to who've said, oh my God, Winter's Tale's my favorite play. And yet we don't see it done that often, as often as I hear people talk about how much they love it. Um, I think because the play is so difficult, and, and I mean that in a, in a joyful way, but the play is so, like, it's exhausting to do because you have to go deep into the suffering. You have to go, no one, people die and they don't come back, right? I mean, Mamilius dies and he dies and Hermione dies and she comes back. But the idea that death, unlike in the comedies, like death is real mm. in The Winter's Tale. Mm. And it's different from the tragedies. It's, it's the merging of both, it's romance, right? It's the first time Shakespeare's going into magic, he's going to spirituality. Um, we're going into territory that we don't really understand. And there's something very, very um, expansive about that. Uh, and I think that's, I, I don't know, where else, where else should I go with that? Yeah, so with that, in terms of sort of the way it worked on you in Fairy Tale, then how does that play out technically in, in production value-wise? Um, the container, we the, the thing we're emphasizing most in this production is the ensemble. Um, we have an ensemble that is Sicilian and an ensemble that is Bohemian and we're using the framing of the cast as storyteller. Um, the opening chorus, uh, we've, we've created an opening prologue chorus that doesn't exist in Shakespeare. Shakespeare opens his play with a two-person scene between Camillo and um, Archidemus, who was cut from the play. Uh, and I've taken the content of that first scene and m mashed it up with the Pandosto text, and we've created a choral opening in a way that this is a cast coming out saying, once upon a time, there reigned a king called Leontes and Cecilia, and we're welcoming you into the story that this, the framework of the telling of the play is a fairy tale, is a bedtime story, right? And you've seen this done in other productions where we open with Mamilius or Paulina um, as the framing device. And uh, the time monologue, which is done by a company, a, a character called Time, has now been broken up into the Bohemian Ensemble as time, as storytellers. We are time, and we're telling you now, we're in Bohemia, right? Um, and there's a gentleman's chorus that happens uh, in the third part of the play where the two companies, the Sicilian cast and the Bohemian cast, they come together uh, in the telling of the reunion and the telling of the unity of, oh, you, oh, you, that beginning of the recognition, that awakening at the end of the play. So we've, we've essentially cut and restructured the text so that it's framed like uh, an ensemble of performers bringing the story to you, inviting you in, to tell you about this once upon a time, et cetera, et cetera. I, I love the device. I think it's really great. Very, I love bringing in the pandesto. That was, 
Did you have that idea? Or? Yeah, it's a, partially because whenever I feel like I go to see a Shakespeare play, I spend the first five minutes saying, like, what are you guys saying? Right? Um, yeah, we, we all know I do, too. And the so. first thing Polixenes says, like, his first line is, nine changes of the watery star. I'm like, what does that mean? Right? And so there's a, always a bit of, like, for my ear, and my ear is not the most sophisticated, so I feel like I just need that extra time of being let into the play. And so for me, the pendosto is, you know, it's elevated text, but it's not as yeah. complicated yeah. as yeah. Shakespeare. Yeah. And so when I hear more, once more a, the facts, right, the facts there was once life. a king called Leontes. I'm like, oh, I know what she's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Leontes had a wife, a lady called Hermione. Oh, I know what that means. Great. And so we set all this up nice and clear. So we jump into it. We go right. Yeah. We go right into yeah. the Shakespeare, and it's not as. Yeah. Alarming. Well, I also me. like the setup of the fairy tale, the, the, yeah. the troupe of actors or the ensemble telling a, a story together. Yeah. What about? Um, I was also struck thinking about uh, you know Lisa talking about generations, and how does it resonate in this play? Because you know it's such an interest to me. It's an interesting thing, mm -hmm. father and daughter mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. a way. Yeah. The, the throwaway and fathers and sons yeah. in in Hamlet. Yeah. Does any of that affect how you you play out the? in the production? Um, this idea of intergenerational, the parent and the child, um, is one of the many ways we've, we know, I, I tend to cut the winner's, winner's tale in half, right? The Cecilia half, Bohemia half, that there is a, you know, the cold play versus the warm play, the play that is of the parental generation and the one that's of the filial generation, um, which is how I've tended to view it. One that is more masculine with Leontes as uh, the king of Sicilia, and one that is more you know, um, feminine, matriarchal, uh, with Perdita as queen of the harvest. Um, one that is very classist, one that is very classless uh, as peasants and rogues. And so what, it's just one of the many ways that we've decided to um, polarize the two halves of the play, to create as much separation as possible, yeah. So the reunion at the end creates a much larger uh, world. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's cool. So there's two questions. How are you going to do the bear? Right? Yeah. That's like the first thing everybody asks. The bear and the statue. And how are you going to do the bear? Right? <laughs> you know, and what are the 16 years? Right? Because oh, she yeah. literally says in time, or she, I always think it's a she, but time says it's been 16 years. Right? And productions obsess about what the 16 years. Right. Like, are we literally, literally doing? Yeah. Are we it, literally doing yeah. it like Eisenhower to, you know, Kennedy period? Right. Are we all going right. to know? Like in our mind. Oh, that's, right. that's 16 years. The last time I wore that collar. Yeah. Right. Um, There's tie dye now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, it must have been 16 the years. Poodle skirts are different. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> So, but yeah, so how did you deal with those two things? Um, I, oh, without giving away too much. Without giving away, like, sure, yeah. sure, sure. The bear, um, for me, the bear has always been the split, the middle of the play, right? The severing where Cecilia ends and the Bohemia officially begins, right? Um, we leave the baby and suddenly there's a storm, a savage comet, this bear comes out and he eats and takes this and he essentially wipes Cecilia away. Any sign of Cecilia that was is no longer. The ship's gone down, Antigonus is dead, and all we have is this baby, and there's no trace of evidence from whence she came. And then in comes the shepherd, like, oh my God, my sheep, where are my sheep? Right? And so that's the beginning of the Bohemian. So functionally, the bear is about the blackout on Cecilia and completely taking out any sign of it, and then Bohemia, the beginning of Bohemia. And so what that meant to me is that for me, the, belts, the bears always felt larger than life. Um, completely out of nowhere, uh, and it's supernatural, right? Uh, yeah, ghosty, and you know, we had kicked around, and so, uh, oh sure, why not? The bear in our production is a large puppet, right? Um, we, well, how it happens and you know, how it's done, you'll see, but uh, for me, it's always felt like Antigonus gets eaten by the earth, is what it feels like, right? Because the, there's a savage clamor, there's a storm, things are happening, it's, the gods are angry, and there's a lot of, you know, nature is terrifying. Earthquakes are terrifying, right? And so when the bear happens, it's not just a random guy in a bear suit across the stage. I think if, if I could, I would have the Elizabethan, you know, theater just like split open, he would just fall in, or, or something like that. It's something that is- that Hard is, to do uh, in rep. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it would bum the whiz out a lot. I did that. But there's something about that moment that is just, you know, it's the, the fury of nature, of the gods, of, what, of whatever, however we want to call it, right? That's what the bear is for me. And that's what we're trying to accomplish um, with this. 
uh, yeah, we'll see. Oh, you'll see. We'll, we'll all see. <laughs> um, 16 years. Um, we've taken some big liberties with that idea. Um, I, it, for, for me, it's never felt like a literal 16 years. It just needs to feel like sometime in the future and she's grown up, right? Um, and I think that we're all sophisticated enough audience members where we can, we can see something set in 1800 and something set in 1900 that, and we can somehow reconcile the literal difference in time but still understand that the emotional track hasn't passed that long. So one of the ways that we've separated the Winter's Tale is that Sicilia is a very ancient kingdom and Bohemia is a new world pastoral play. And that goes with your binary that you're setting up anyway, right? Right, right. That there's something very, very ancient. Very male, male uh, very, right. class, classical, uh, ancient versus... Yeah, the, kind of a romance, past, romantic pastoral, uh -huh. right. And so um, we changed the text to say 16 ages instead of 16 years. Oh, that's clever. That's yeah. good, yeah. Perdita still comes out, you know, what, and for me it's like, yeah, it can be 16,000 years, but what's important is that it's an entirely new cast of people. It's an entirely different generation. And we can say, sure, yeah, 16, she's 16 years old, I believe that, right? Sure, she's from that ancient world once upon a time. Um, but I feel like in my mind, the emotional logic of her age doesn't have to be literal, right? It's more about, and here's a paradigm shift. And here's a whole new place, a whole new time space severed. Yeah. Costuming and set, is setting to a certain yeah. degree, and the, and the spirit and feel of it, all of a sudden there's music, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. as well in that world. A lot right? of music. Not so much yeah. in the first half, but definitely in the second. Yeah, right? the, the playing of music, the kind of spirit of um, the community. We have live music in the second half with Autolycus, of course, because it helps when you have a, a rogue and a wandering musician in the play that, that Shakespeare has written in for you. Yeah. Um, and our actor playing Autolycus, Stephen Michael Spencer, he is lovely. He is such a, such a, uh, a charming character to watch. Um, and I think we'll have fun. And there's singing and dancing uh, in Bohemia that I think the Sicilians are very jealous of because we don't get to sing and dance. We just, we're just sad and we're so reverent. <laughs> um, but I think it'll be, it'll be a nice contrast. And there's something very satisfying about seeing these two come together at the end, that when you're in one place for a long time and then another place for a long time, um, the meeting of the two feels very, right. <laughs>